I have been working in this area for 20 years, or not quite 20 years, but it's getting close to 20 years, so I know quite a bit about the archaeology of this particular region, mm -hmm. which is in northwestern New Mexico. And, uh, and I knew that there were many I uh, objects that were buried beneath the surface, so uh, certainly buildings that sometimes you could see poking out of the, out of the soil, but as often as not, uh, they were completely obscured beneath the surface uh, or sometimes covered with brush or otherwise not very easily seen. By chance, I was doing a lecture at the University of Arkansas, and they have a center there that uh, does a lot of remote sensing, has a, quite a, a bit of expertise in that area. So uh, an archaeologist there came up to me and he said, oh, I've been developing this technique, and usually I work in Syria, but I can't work in Syria now for obvious reasons. So he said, how about if I come out and you know, we can collaborate on this. Uh, you have the archaeology and I have this technique we would like to try to experiment with. Uh, so certainly having the drone, and this was a custom-built drone. Uh, it started out as a kit. Uh, but then it was customized, so it has an onboard GPS, uh, so you have exact positioning data. It has, of course, uh, a gimbal, which is used to actually hold the camera. Uh, and you can put all kinds of cameras, all kinds of equipment off of this gimbal. Um, but it allows you to uh, move the camera around remotely um, from the ground. And it also, of course, makes sure that the camera is stable as the drone itself um, pitches back and forth and, and, uh, and moves through the air. So uh, there has to be quite a bit of uh, technical background developed for this, and that includes software that was designed in order, to, uh, in order to basically map out the flight pattern for the drone so it makes sure that it covers the, the, the ground as much as possible. You can imagine because you're taking dozens and dozens of snapshots, you have to have a way to ensure that the photographs, the thermal photographs, overlap so that later, back in the laboratory, you can um, stitch them together, of course, digitally on a computer, and that way develop this, this uh, you know, quite comprehensive and detailed thermal map of the surface. In order to do that, uh, you can't really do it from an airplane or even from a helicopter because you're too far above the ground and the resolution would be too poor. So uh, the drone provides uh, exactly the kind of height above the ground you would need in order to do this. So we actually did this, uh, um, or you could say late at night or early in the morning. It has to be, uh, it would be around 4 a.m. or so because that's when the amount of heat uh, has dissipated the most from the surrounding soils, the matrix, and, this, and the, uh, the masonry and the other um, remains from the archaeological sites actually are still retaining some of the heat. So you get the, the greatest distinction in thermal signal between the the uh, things you want to find and the things you're not interested in, in um, finding. Once you get out there, it doesn't take very long to do it. You, um, you, know, you get the drone launched in the air, which you do um, by hand with the remote control, but then the, uh, the onboard GPS and the um, wirelessly controlled um, software package, of course, then has the drone doing these basically transects back and forth across the area that you want to survey, taking photographs at a regular interval. The fact of the matter is that it covers uh, an area that if we were doing this the old-fashioned way of archaeologists walking across the landscape, um, it would have taken uh, probably a few days to do the work that could be done in basically an hour of, of uh, work out there. The test will be whether we can move out of these kind of uh, desert environments. Uh, it worked really well there because you get a big uh, temperature difference between the daytime temperatures and the nighttime temperatures, and that allows for the heat to dissipate. Um, that doesn't happen um, as easily in, say, places like here in Jacksonville, where uh, you know during the summer, the temperature difference between the day and the night isn't quite as great. You're not getting quite as much heat loss. Um, and then, of course, there's concerns about uh, it's fine if the drone has a unscheduled landing when you're in the middle of nowhere in the desert, but if you're, for example, trying to find Fort Caroline or doing work elsewhere, um, you know, in Louisiana or um, Georgia or, or any kind of Rhode Island where there's lots of, of water, you're afraid that your drone is going to suddenly plummet into the water, in which case you would lose a lot of expensive equipment. So, so it will, it's, a, it's a good first step. There's still quite a bit of work that needs to be done to really refine it.